please start <clears throat> so welcome again uh, to this uh, another yet webinar and this is going to be on the platform of all india ophthalmological society as well as irsi the webinar is being coordinated by dr sonu goel and we again have a galaxy of speakers with us from all over the globe and this webinar is going to be on the challenging uh, situations video presentations on the uh, challenging situ situations in cataract surgery so we have uh, dr bruna ventura with us uh, from brazil dr ahmed asa from cairo uh, dr gorav luthra uh, from india and from RSI, irsi uh, then we have uh, dr ashwin agarwal dr sergio uh, uh, canabrava from brazil again and of course our very good friend professor chi soon fake uh, from uh, singapore uh, i would uh, i would now uh, ask our president uh, all india ophthalmological society dr mahipal sachdev to say a few words uh, before we begin the webinar thank you very much uh, dr namrata thank you sonu for organizing this uh, webinar and gaurav and ashwin uh, i think uh, uh, difficult times we are all uh, trying to uh, come back and restart our work uh, but uh, obviously there are going to be challenges that all of us are trying to get back to uh, normal as soon as possible but uh, during this period that we have it is very very important that we use this time uh, to the best uh, possible manner and maybe keep our members updated i think uh, the new normal might be webinars and virtual conferences uh, rather than physical conferences and meetings so i think thank you everyone for joining in and uh, it will enrich the people who are uh, watching especially from india and overseas so i think without much ado we will uh, move forward with the uh, webinar for today and uh, let's hope that we get valuable pearls uh, from all the speakers and in the discussion thank you So I would also like to introduce the esteemed panelists with us. Uh, my very good friend, Dr. Sonal Tuli. Sonal, welcome from University of uh, Florida. Dr. Vinod Arora, the master behind the eye light uh, group of the WhatsApp uh, from Dehradun, is with us here today. And then we have moderators, Dr. Priya Nara uh, from Ahmedabad, Dr. Rohit Om Prakash from Amritsar. Uh, Dr. Ritika Sachdev uh, from Delhi, and uh, Dr. Rajesh Sena, who is going to be He is there, I think, from Delhi again. So, Sonu, over to you for uh, this uh, webinar. So, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, Dr. Mahipal, and Secretary Dr. Namrata, for giving us this uh, podium. And I think you have done most of my job. And uh, I would just like to rush through. Uh, so, this was a brainchild of Professor Amar Agarwal. don't limit your challenges challenge your limits i think with this concept we came up with this video symposium on challenging cases and we decided to have the world's best to offer to us and offer to the whole globe the best of the cases so thank you team aios professor mahipal professor namrata professor rajesh sena and the team irsi professor ramar agarwal dr gs dhami dr gorav luthra thank you the chair uh, professor mahipal namrata uh, dr sunil tuli for kindly accepting our invite and dr vinod aroda and with me uh, priya ritika rajesh and dr rohit om prakash and once again i like to thank all my presenters professor tail raviv uh, dr bruna dr ashwin dr gerardo dr ahmed and dr sergio partha we are on gorav and professor chi thank you so much and uh, i'll also like to thank johnson and johnson for supporting us so without wasting much of time i would start with our first presenter and uh, to start we have professor tail raviv sir are you ready so he is an associate professor of ophthalmology uh, from the new york i n ear infirmary of mount sinai he is the founder medical director of the i center of new york he is a prolific refractive surgeon and he'll be talking to us on the challenging posterior capsule the hydro dissection free supra capsular technique in posterior polar and post anti vegf open capsule all to you thank you dr goel and welcome everyone i'm happy to be here uh from new york we're going to talk about something we all see here but i have three short cases in a few minutes that are going to show the fragile capsule these are cases that we can get through and you can see your posterior polar 
Uh, my practice is mostly refractive Cadillac surgery and femto, most of it. But for these cases, I usually avoid femto. And you can see my technique right from the bat. I avoid hydrodelineation and hydrodissection. I basically just go in with uh, my second instrument and elevate this. You know, posterior polar cataracts did fine in the extra cap era. And I basically want to convert this to an extra cap. It was the introduction of phaco and fluidics and hydrodissection that made us uh, have problems with this. So here, a, a hydrodissection free technique, which I'll show a few more times, which I do on pretty much all my soft posterior polar cataracts. Once the lens is brought forward, we can use our phaco 2 settings. In this case, I'm using a Venturi setting to uh, aspirate these. In this case, uh, this is a soft posterior polar where we want to do them. And then all the attention turns to the posterior capsule. Is it open? It's not. At that point, we want to avoid that area till the end. And we want to avoid trampolining. So I always use this elastic when I transition to INA. And here I'm able to put in a premium lens in this patient who had a posterior polar, maybe they nervous. Here's another one, presumed posterior polar. The other eye has a more classic presentation. So we're going to take all precautions. Again, a manual capsulotomy. And here, this is about a three plus NS. And what I'm doing here is hydrodelineation very carefully. You could see I want to find that plane. I do not want to hydrodissect, so I'm going very gingerly. This is not my usual hydro steps. I'm going to hydro, and because it's kind of dense, I want to just use my same technique of supercapsular without hydrodissection, but I'm going to hydro delineate, and then once I've got this demarcated, I'm going to use my second instrument to elevate, and this is the trick. It looks like a tire iron. You're going to go in. You're going to find that little groove, and very gently, Find the plane of that hydrodelineation. I know it looks unusual, but once you've done this uh, many, many times, and you gently pull that up the lens towards the phaco, about one third of the lens is forward, and here I'm rotating it, so two thirds remains in the bag. And what I've done by doing this technique is I've avoided any pressure on that posterior capsule, which as we know in posterior polar may or may not be weak, fragile, or non-existent. And again, once it's up, we can just use a sort of a Venturi slow settings here, nothing fast to avoid any trampolining. We can switch over then to INA in the periphery first, always ready in case the posterior capsule is open. But typically if we do this, we can preserve it. And here's a case of a big posterior capsular plaque. This patient had a vitrectomy and this could happen after an injection, got a white cataract a day later. I usually wait about a week. And here I'm going to hydrodelineate. You know, we know there's an open capsule here where there was an open capsule or there was some kind of breach. Gentle height, this is a pretty dense lens, so I have to hydrodelineate. If it's soft, I skip that step. You can see I've got that golden ring. And again, I don't want to hydro, this is where the open capsule allows me to, any kind of hydro dissection may bring this into the posterior segment. So I'm going to gently, try not to disrupt any zonules, and bring this lens up. All forces are towards me. There's no fluid forces below. I'm using some viscoelastic here to, to just uh, visco elevate and to protect that posterior capsule, which may be open for all I know. I'm using a slow motion technique here in my Peco 2s and Venturi settings to make sure I keep that lens as one piece in case there is an opening. And now I'm trying to explore what is happening here. Is that a capsule? Is it a big plaque? I put some visco elastic in, I'll go to my INA and I'll take out these larger pieces now gently and slowly with the INA. If I have to mash in uh, the pieces with my second instrument, I will. I want to keep the chamber formed. I'm not really sure till the end what's happening. And what I don't show here in the videos I've examined, and that is just one big plaque. It is still solid. And I'm not going to be a hero here. I'm not going to try to get that out. I have a perfect rexus. I have an intact capsule with a big plaque. I'm going to put in my lens of choice. And the patient did really well and had a YAG capsule out of me about six weeks later. I chose not to do a primary posterior rexus on such a large capsule opening on a post vitrectomy eye. So I use that technique. Uh, there's many techniques for the fragile posterior capsule, but I like this one because it allows me to be in control. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tal, for that wonderful technique. I think that is splendid. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, what is the size of the rexus that you're aiming in this case? That's a perfect question. I want to make it as large as possible so I can prolapse the lens without difficulty. But I also want to make sure I can get 360 degree overlap. So I make it about a 5.5. Also, if there is a tear or if there is a hole or anything, it allows me to put in a three piece IOL with a six millimeter optic and posterior capture. So 5.5 is my perfect amount. I've toyed with using Femto, uh, but I've seen when I use fragmentation or segmentation, I do get bubbles and those can get into that posterior area. So I've avoided Femto, although I'm thinking of using Femto just for the Rexus to make sure I get that 5.5 uh, more accurately in the future of these cases. Perfect. Can I just request you to stop sharing your screen so that we can have you on the bigger screen? Absolutely. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Rohit Om Prakash, sir, do you have any questions? Uh, can you unmute, sir? Can you unmute, sir? I think, I think it's been an excellent presentation by what he has done is he has taken the whole nucleus piece away from the fragile posterior capsule. Uh, doctor, uh, my question for uh, Dr. Mahipal Sachdev, uh, would, do you do it uh, in the bag or do you believe in bringing it supracapsular area? So I think it will depend on the hardness of the nucleus. Uh, essentially, normally, as he is showing, most of them are soft cataracts, so it might not be a bad idea to get it at the supracapsular area and do that. And obviously, if you have fragile capsule, uh, if you want to have the support of uh, endocapsular ring, etc., at that particular time, uh, that could also be used. Uh, the only thing is, if there is a, I uh, really don't know. At the beginning, he said that he would not prefer to do a femto. I really don't know as to what would be the specific contraindication for doing a femto uh, in case the capsule is slightly uh, uh, floppy or whatever. I don't know, uh, Doctor Taylor. Are you, are you specifically? Is there any specific thing against a femto? Well, typically, for a dense cataract, I'll use a femto, a femto segmentation and fragmentation technique on my average case. Yes. Uh, in these cases, they're usually soft, like you said, but if, if they were very dense in a posterior polar, which we do see, uh, my fear is uh, when I, the femtosecond system I use, when I fragment, I do release a lot of uh, gas bubbles, and I do fear a pneumodissection, uh, you know, can get into the opening. It's theoretical, and I think if I did it next time, I would just leave a very large, uncut posterior area, and I think I'd be able to avoid that. But so far, I just use my manual for these techniques, and I love femto. I'm 75% femto. On I'll the be cautious. Doctor, on, on the contrary, if we have a posterior polar cataract, I would uh, I would uh, always do a, a femto because you can leave a, a larger default at the posterior part and then uh, you would keep the opening uh, covered. We just published that in the uh, yes, yes, yes. surgery in the February where we have shown 100% OCT specificity and sensitivity where we can detect preoperatively whether there's a uh, posterior capsular defect that is pre-existing or not and uh, femto uh, doing give you a good capsulotomy as also fractionating the nucleus allows you to go right up till the very end uh, before the dehiscence actually appears so for a polar i would definitely definitely do a femto procedure uh, as professor, professor tile one question from you uh, with the harder nucleus which you have uh, what is the what are the things you are doing to take care of the endothelium with the hard cataract around? Uh, would it be good enough to put an IUL scaffold so that you can work at a deeper plane or would you like to cut it? Or how do you take care of the, uh, you know, the cordial endothelium in those circumstances? You know, if I can work in the bag, I always will for a very dense uh, nucleus or use femto. But if I have to supercap, uh, this thing, there's many supercap techniques. You know, there's bringing the whole thing up, there's tilt and tumble. This one is just, a slight elevation. We prolapse maybe one third of it. So even in a, in a dense case, uh, I sometimes use this technique when I have a four plus NS with a normal capsule and I just can't break it up. I'll just prolapse it and very gingerly start at the outside and work my way in. As long as you keep two thirds of the lens in the bag and the other third at the iris plane, it works pretty well. The, the trick is to have a large enough capsulotomy and to keep that, uh, that tilt there. You don't want to bring everything up. You want to have just a little bit pointing up and that's typically how I do it. And in the I think that's yeah, please, please go ahead. I think that would work very well because uh, when you have just one third of it prolapsing, uh, you are not actually compromising the endothelium at that point. Great, yeah, absolutely. I think it's the combination of two techniques. One is the mechanical expression and second is the visco expression. So by combining two, we are just saving the stress on posterior capsule. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, once you avoid the stress on the posterior capsule, the things become much easier. And partially prolapsed nucleus can be easily taken out. I think the key in all of these cases, I think, to remember for our viewers is that good hydrodelineation, right? I mean, that's the key, is to separate the nucleus out from the, the cortex, um, no matter what, whether you do it intracapsular or extracapsular. I think uh, in uh, patients wherein we have nuclear sclerosis grade two or grade three, you can do even without hydrodissection and uh, hydrodelineation. You just do a modified stop and chop wherein you create a valley and you separate the two nuclear uh, uh, into two nuclear halves. Then cross chopping can help you, you know, bring the uh, 
uh, emulsify the nuclear pieces suggested to the six o'clock one. And then with hydro, with not with the hydro, with repositioning, you can you know, e easily take it out. I think we should move on to the next one, Dr. Sonu, for that matter. That was an excellent demonstration of your technique. And, uh, and there are multiple ways by which these posterior polar can be handled. And I think that works well uh, for you. I think that's amazing. Thank you so much. I'll request Priya could... now to uh, take over. Priya, yeah. Yes, so I would add one more point, Sonu, to it. I think viscote is very important without having any financial interest, whether your posterior capsule is open or whether you have to protect the endothelium, which Dr. Rohit Om Prakash was talking about. So that is a tool which you need. That is a OBD which you really need to have at this. Stage. That's a very important take yeah. home. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So now we move on to our next speaker, Dr. Bruna Ventura. So, uh, Dr. Bruna, she's the uh, head of the cataract and department uh, of cataract department at Brazil, and she is a coordinator of specialization courses in ophthalmology. So, uh, Dr. Bruna is going to show us uh, a video where she says that when a partially amputated haptic is a solution and it's not a problem. So, we look forward to your presentation, Dr. Bruna. Thank you so much, Priya, and everyone, Sono, for the this invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, do you see my, my, my video, right? You're seeing my yeah. screen. Yeah, yeah, we are. Wonderful, wonderful. So we're going to speak on when a partially amputated haptic is a solution and not a problem. I wanted to introduce to you a technique that's called the Ventura Amputated Idle Haptic Technique, which is for patients with lens subluxation as this one in the pictures. The technique consists of first inserting a CTR, an endocapsular tension ring, to expand the bag 360 degrees and decrease the stress in the zonules in all of its circumference. After we cut, partially cut, one of the haptics of a three-piece IOL, as we see here in this picture, in order to get the IOL optic centered in the patient's visual axis, even though the bag is not perfectly centered. Here at the end of this case, this was a one-year-old boy, so I ended up um, injecting triopsinolone in the side to modulate the, the inflammation, but we can see the IOL um, occupying the whole pupillary area. The prerequisites for this um, technique are less than 210 degrees of subluxation, have zonular remnant in the area of subluxation, and not have um, vitreous in the area of subluxation. Here's another case in which we started with the femto, after the implantation of the CTR, we see that the bag's already a little bit more expanded. We relax the zonules by, by implanting the CTR. And now I'm partially amputating one of the haptics. I always introduce the haptic that is intact first and let the, the three-piece IOL unfold in the eye and position it in the bag by holding on the partially amputated um, haptic and you see that I rotate the IOL based on my intact haptic. So this par partially amputated haptic is not having any traction on, the, on the, the bag itself, on the equator. Here I'm gently doing the less movements to position this bag exactly where I wanna leave it in order for the IOL optic to be occupying the patient's visual axis and centered in the patient's visual axis. Here is this patient, the first day post-op, we see a very stable lens with minimal pseudophacoiridodonesis. Here, one year after surgery, the lens continues very stable. When we dilate, we see the lens is exactly where we left it. And that's the reason why it's so important to have this amputated haptic. Since 99, we've been doing this technique without progressive decentrations of the bag IOL complex. The pseudophacoiridodonesis decreases with time and it's better when the patients are operated younger. But every time we, we present this, this technique, people, our colleagues are worried about this amputated haptic perforating the capsular bag. So I wanted to bring to you this next case of a patient that was my only patient in which I actually did have a perforation. After the CTR implantation, we see that the bag is more expanded than before. I partially amputated one of the haptics and first inserted the, the haptic that is intact and I start rotating the lens based on my haptic that is holding on to my haptic that is partially amputated. And you're going to notice that when it, in just a few seconds, when, when we're paying attention here, the lens is going to start shifting this way. We all see that. 
And that's when I saw that this was my only case that I managed to perforate this bag in the periphery. So what did I do? I gently pulled back this uh, amputated haptic into the bag and started replacing the lens to exactly a place where I wanted it to be um, to, so that the eye optic would be centered in the patient's visual axis. So we saw that the, even though there was a perforation, it did not extend, even though I have a CTR in. And here we can see perfectly how the, the amputated haptic is um, stuck there in the equator, it's not perf it didn't perforate again or it didn't rip open the bag. It's very stable at the end of the surgery, close the pupil, and this patient evolved very well. In these patients with Marfan and, and other um, dystrophies in children, we see a lot the <laughs> capsular bag very elastic. So it's very hard for us to perforate. But if you for some reason have a perforation, we just saw that um, it evolves very well. We just need to actually um, pull it back in and very gently reposition it to a safe place. And that's what I wanted to present. Thank you so much. Nice. Thank you, Dr. Bruna, for uh, this presentation. Well, uh, I do have a couple of questions here. Um, uh, let us go through that. Uh, I would, the first question would be like, uh, when you are uh, placing up the haptic, the amputated haptic, is there a specific axis or uh, in consideration with the sublux, the area of the subluxation where you would place the uh, routine hap haptic and the uh, haptic which you have been cut through? Is there something specific about it? Um, there is and there is not. So it, the, the good thing of this, one of the advantages of this technique is that you only need <clears throat> a three-piece IOL and a CTR to manage these specific cases in which we, we discussed the, at the beginning, what are the, the patient needs to have zonular remnant, doesn't need, ha, has to not have vitreous in the AC, and has to have at least less than 210 degrees of subluxation. But we can use in patients that have very mild subluxation and moderate subluxation, let's say it that way. So the amount of haptic that we leave depends on the amount of lens sublux of the lens subluxation that the patient has. And based on that, when we're, we're positioning the lens in the eye, we can tilt it, um, tighter it, so put it a little bit more. Um, it's usually the, the amputated haptic is near the area of subluxation, but it's not in a specific area, let's say perpendicular to the subluxation, okay. or it's not that way. Depending on the subluxation and the amount of haptic that you cut, Sometimes you just change a little bit the position of the haptics to, to obtain the centration of the IOL optic. Bruna, stop sharing your screen, please. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Another question ah. that I would like to ask you what, uh, is that in cases of progressive zonulopathy, uh, like suppose you have a case of the muffins, uh, how much uh, follow-up do you have? Because these are the cases where, you know, the remaining zonal would also go off in some period of time. So what would be the uh, stability of this and how would uh, it remain centered? Like maybe because it's a progressive, the, the, one of the cases that you showed was much more than 180 degrees. It was much more than that. So for mm -hmm. how long uh, period do you have a follow-up of all these cases? Like? So this, this technique, uh, my father was the one that invented in 99. I wasn't operating in 1999. He was the one operating and he, he, he developed this technique. And at per, his first case was in a traumatic patient, but right after he started doing in Marfan syndrome patients. So he has a follow-up of 20 years, 19 years. So it was 99 that he started. And what we see in these, these patient, patients is that very interestingly, after we implant the CTR, which relaxes the zonule 360 degrees, so you avoid tensioning the zonules in any of the meridians because you don't have like one ring segment sutured to one specific point, which would cause um, stress 180 degrees from there. You have just a, a CTR expanding this bag 360 degrees. So you relax the zonio 360 and you insert this, this, this IOL. What we see with time is that the pseudophacoiridodonesis of the patient remains minimal. Of course, that when the patient already has a very important phacodonesis before surgery, this wouldn't be the preferred technique to go. So it's very important for the patient to have minimal um, phacodonesis okay. before surgery. So meaning that he or she still has a, a stability of that bag, even though the subluxation is present. And based on the, the syndrome like Marfan, 
you would expect it to be progressive. But interestingly, when we operate on these patients and the earlier we operate, the better, the bag remains stable. Bag IOL complex remains stable over time. We yeah, don't there's, one have more any... quick, there's one more quick question for you, Dr. Bruna. Uh, the audience is asking that, is there any specific sizing of amputation of the haptic according uh, to the exit length? And how much do you amputate? Is it 50% or one third? It depends on the, the, the amount of subluxation. So after I implant the ring, after I implant the CTR, I, I see how much of the, the, I estimate how much of the, the, the haptic I have to amputate. So it's not 50% or leave two millimeters. It, it, you don't really have a fixed amount because we can use this in patients that have very mild subluxation until moderate subluxation. So it really depends after you put the CTR in, you see how much of the haptic you need to 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 cut off. Okay. A uh, quick comment from Dr. Manipal, sir. If you could quickly uh, comment on this technique. Well, I personally feel uh, I would still have some reservations on this particular technique because uh, if there is a progression, then things could become uh, a little different. I would rather fix the bag uh, and uh, make it central. Uh, then uh, leave it eccentric and try to work on the uh, IOL because I think uh, maybe your father started it 19 years ago at that particular time. Uh, the uh, uh, ring segments where you could fix it with sclera, etc., is not there. And we have Ashwin here who would uh, surely say that he will go in for a glued IOL straight off. <laughs> <laughs> we, each, we each have our preferred techniques, and that's the beauty, I think, of, yeah. of medicine. Yes. Um, I, I thought it was very interesting that Priya asked for follow-up. And in our, in our experience in the long-term follow-up, we, we haven't had a case that the bag IOL complex um, luxated to the vitreous or um, developed a very important pseudofake yes. But I respect the, the people that prefer other techniques, like I'm sure Ashvin would prefer glued IOL in his case. But no, it works. Specifically in progressive zonulopathy, that's yeah. the only problem when you're looking at progressive zonulopathy cases of progressive uh, traumatic is fine where you don't expect the zonulopathy to kind of increase. But if you are looking at places where more zonules are going to get affected over time, uh, that, uh, yeah. that's the cause of further dehydration. I would maybe it's not luxated into the vitreous, but it could uh, increase the shift. We do have encountered a few cases wherein uh, uh, surgery was done for Marfan's long back and uh, uh, it decentered on one side with the capsular fibrosis because most of these capsules are a little lax. So these lax capsules, they fibrose quite a lot more than the taut capsules. And that is why these, even with the CTR and the whole thing uh, gets decent and we have a few cases and then uh, all these cases the complex was removed and blue dial was done so uh, in traumatic uh, subluxation uh, i thought maybe this innovation will be really good i don't know about progressive ones just a yeah, small question yeah please uh, uh, i was wondering if there any role of making the things smooth i mean we have cut it very that thing is very sharp just like the yamna's technique we do heat cautery. Can we make it a little smoother yes. so don't perforate the capsule? Yes, absolutely. That's why that's why I wanted to bring this this only case that perforated for you all to yes. see that it, it it even if you have a perforation, I think everyone expects the bag to rip open because you have a CTR, but it doesn't rip open. We just saw that, and it it's actually very hard for us to to perforate the lens as Raj Raj. Rajesh just said because of this the elasticity of these bags that are so so big um, but one thing that I wanted to point out is I operate a lot of, of children and it's very interesting to see in these progressive cases as you were mentioning that sometimes from one year to the other the progression in the subluxation is so important that sometimes it makes us completely not be able to, to use the bag and have to do a lensectomy for some reason and, and fixate the IOL in the sclera or like glued IOL and et cetera. So every time I see a patient with Marfan or whatever cause of subluxation that doesn't achieve a good vision with glasses and needs surgery, I indicate the surgery early because I know it's a progressive disease. So if I wait six months, one year, two years, it will only make it very much worse. 
So usually these patients in which I do this technique are patients that come, they are very young, two, three, four, five years old, and I'm, I'm continuing seeing them and I see exactly the moment where their glasses are not working anymore and I need to operate right away. So I operate on them very early on in the, the, the bag instability. I know the, the, we all know it's a progressive disease, but, and it's very interesting to see that when I don't operate for some reason, let's say the parents don't come to, to, for surgery and they come one or two years after, the amount of instability is so big. Well, and I don't see that when I operate, when I indicated the surgery. So for some reason, the surgery, it's as if it, it makes the, the cicatrization uh -huh. I like to uh, interrupt in between because of the paucity of time. I like uh, yes. uh, I like to thank you for that wonderful presentation. So now we have Ritika to introduce uh, Ashwin. Please, Ritika. So uh, we now welcome Ashwin. He is the head of clinical services at the Agarwal Group of Eye Hospital and a master, has a mastery over all innovative surgeries from the glued eye to the pinhole pupilloplasty. And he's going to showcase a four-in-one collection of his surgeries. So over to you, Ashwin. Thank you, Ritika. I hope everybody can hear me clearly and see my video as well. Is it playing? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, thank you, uh, Dr. Sonu, Dr. Ritika, Dr. Mm -hmm. Namrata, Gaurav, and everybody on the panel uh, for having me. I wanted to showcase this because I think it's very important in today's world that we understand how to do these combination procedures and how they've probably changed. So if you look at this case, it came to me with... Uh, scarred pseudophagic bullous scatopathy, but uh, also scarred for over a long period of time. So what I know I have to do is most of these cases, if I've understood them right, is pre predominantly, at least 80% of the cases I get are predominantly because IOL, uh, uh, this instability or because of witness in the ante the chamber. So what I started to do in these cases is first up, make a flap whenever I know that there is some form of vitreous in the chamber. If you see, I have a big pupil there. So some vitreous involvement uh, was intended. And when we saw it on slit lamp, we did see some bit of it through those clearish areas. So what I've done is made my uh, skeletal flaps 180 degrees apart. And believe me, you can't do a Yamane right now in a closed globe. What I'm trying to show here is a closed globe surgery completely throughout uh, as much as possible. So what I've done is also made a skeletal wound and my infusion port. Once I've made my infusion port and I've got a sturdy eye, I've also done a sclerotomy and you can see, I can see the needle tip even through the sclerotomy. And you can see that needle tip better with the endo eliminator if you pass an endo eliminator inside the eye. After making my paracentesis, I can use a rod to kind of dislocate or dislodge any kind of adhesion there is with the iris and that IOL. Once I know that I am pretty much free. Now I'm also doing a vitrectomy to ensure there's no vitreous strand through the sclerotomies that I've made under the flaps. This so that there is no vitreous that is going to be snagging when I'm trying to explant or remove that IOL. The scleral wound which I had made is going to help me explant that intraocular lens, which I know is not the intended one for the future. So I'm replacing that intraocular lens through the scleral wound. Again, I'm not trying to use an open sky, which is what I think I used to do about four or five years back. Now I've completely moved over to this technique where I'm doing everything under closed globe because I hate doing, and I know all corneal surgeons will hate doing as long as they can do less, less number of time, the open sky, they would love it. So I, once I've closed the wounds and I've externalized both the haptics, if you saw very clearly, you, because the haptics are blue in color, you can actually visualize that using an endo illuminator, even through a scarred cornea like this. And I'm not able to do a, uh, I would love to do a PDEC in these cases, but ideally in this case, particularly, I'm not going to do a PDEC because it's a scarred cornea. The anterior stroma also is scarred. But I am able to do a single pass four through pupilloplasty, even through this scarred cornea, because I, again, I'm using an endo illuminator. And Dr. Maipal showed earlier uh, in one of the webinars that you can use a chandelier light, which is also something I think people should start using a little bit more. Uh, but I understand that anterior segment surgeon might have apprehension, apprehension by, for using that. But if you see here, using a endo illuminator, single pass go through, glue, uh, explantation of intraocular lens and a glued IOL, I'm able to now attain a proper anterior chamber reconstruction, which I've pre pretty much done. Now, all I have left is here to do a 
OPK and op uh, uh, but make sure that you when you stab the wound and you make sure that you remove the recipient button make sure that the desmes sometimes gets attached to that uh, iris tissue and we don't want that so make sure that all those tags come out because that can lead to uh, some form of uh, rejection uh, later on uh, failure later on the next i'm making my four cardinal uh, sutures and now the 16 i'm in interest of time i've not shown that but uh, ideally this is how i do all my combination uh, procedures nowadays where everything can be done in one sitting and uh, it gives me absolutely gives me a really uh, uh, pleasure to announce that i have not been able to see a better result in the past one week after removing all the vitreous strands after removing all the additions from the anterior chamber pract practically reconstructing the whole anterior uh, segment and then doing the opk so that also gives the life of the uh, endothelial cells of the new donor tissue the maximum life you can actually give it i'm going to stop my share so we can also have a discussion i would love to know a little bit more from the corneal uh, surgeons here what they are doing in also uh, that, that was a fantastic surgery actually uh, shwin and very well managed i must uh, compliment you for that and you keep doing such cases and i also felt like you know as if you know uh, i also keep getting such cases so it was a very familiar kind of a picture uh, one thing uh, maybe uh, uh, we would like to do an asoct and see how much is the scarring of the stroma and if it's not that much if it's more of an epithelial scarring we may think of doing an ultra thin dissect not a pdec or a dmec in this but ultra thin dissect is uh, probably one option which can be tried in this in i think uh, i think suggestion. i yeah i think i quite agree with that ultra thin dissect because that will be totally closed chamber you don't have to open it at all and ritika has written a beautiful paper which is you know quoted uh, has several of citations on on uh, expulsive hemorrhage during keratoplasty and uh, i was just remembering that you know when you were talking about the uh, about the advantages of the uh, closed lobes closed lobe surgery and yeah. but having said this you could do all that that you did open globe also and yeah. uh, yes ultra thin dissect uh, is another thing which may have you know it may not have taken care of the stromal opacity entirely but yes partially you are clear there so one of the reasons i even learned uh, this was necessity i mean i did face an uh, expulsion once and that's what actually gave me the intention to go ahead and you know start moving into a completely closed globe as long as possible say yes. i'm only open for 20 25 seconds max so so this is technically very yeah. difficult to do everything yeah. to the hazy cornea including the pupilloplasty and technically very challenging absolutely all you yes. could do with a closed globe mm -hmm. and using the endo eliminator that was really very challenging yeah i so, think the combination of the uh, fourth throw pupilloplasty is very important here it really divides the uh, i into two segments which you really need for a pdec and it prevents future pass so i think the combination of both row pupilloplasty is what uh, ashwin yeah. was trying to highlight and as corneal surgeons we all should use this technique we've all been doing some iridoplasty open sky but this fourth row pupilloplasty is a great technique Sorry. and uh, ashwin any tips for your uh, fourth row pupilloplasty for people who've not tried it yet uh I, I think there are enough and more webinars from my listing. You can always have a look at it. But 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 having said that, I think the most important trick is to try it on a uh, actual model outside. If you actually try it outside, it becomes much more simpler going inside and actually trying Absolutely. it out. Absolutely. Yeah. Ashwin, that is a very to quick add has, one thing here yes. that you know this fourth throw pupilloplasty is very simple and very easy to do. And if you are doing ultra thin dissect, combining with ultra thin dissect, right. the tamponade effect is very good. Very good. So Absolutely. I very frequently I combine this SFT along with ultra thin dissect, and the tamponade effect is fantastic. Yes. The Ashwin, there is a quick question for you. Yes. Uh, the audience wants to know that what's the uh, like? How do you calculate the IOL power in these cases? And secondly, they also want to know that what is the chance of leakage and how will you manage in these cases? so my iol power uh, first of all i i do it exactly like how i do it in the bag so in a bag is because my lens is going back into the same position as what i would have in a glued iol in any case i think uh, they would be much more concerned about how would you go ahead with the keratometry would you uh, like how would you calculate the iol power for these cases 
okay the, the, i think it's based on axial length and based on uh, so uh, so in that generally what happens maybe is not the other eye capture the keratometry yeah. so you use a standard keratometry and you do it you do sometimes it. when the cornea corneal clarity is a little better then maybe you can do yeah, peripheral video keratography etc but for a case like this where the cornea is hazy and keratometry is not captured you just take a standard keratometry and then go yeah ahead. many people they go ahead with the keratometry values of the other eye also and they take taking into consideration that yeah. by and large both the eyes both the eyes are the same yeah that's the same but yeah, that's, changing, but in this case we are changing the cornea so cornea. it is the cornea of the donor Correct. so the keratometry so you, yeah. so you and just need to take count how you are suturing and how much you are oversizing the cornea if you are oversizing yes. it also Yeah, absolutely. So you asked about yeah. the leak. I don't. I have not seen a leak in this except if you're doing in pediatric cases, uh, and that too from the sclerotomies that you make. I don't think you see it from the corneal wound, uh, but from the sclerotomies you might see some leak. So what you do is after you externalize the haptics, I always uh, suture the sclerotomies as well before closing the flap down, and that has always helped me in two situations. One is whenever I have a leak or uh, pediatric cases, and the second is. whenever i feel that this case has a chance of that uh, iol haptic dislodging back into the eye so that suture helps snug that keep keep that uh, haptic also into place yeah super boss friend and thank you so much for that thank wonderful you, presentation so now dr rajesh uh, please uh, welcome dr gerardo uh, i would like to welcome dr gerardo for his uh, presentation let's have his presentation now Hello, how are you? Good morning in my country. Good evening in, in India. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I give you a, a virtual, virtual hug. Uh, my English is bad. That's the reason why my video uh, is with audio. Please let me know if you can hear. I share. Okay. 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 Let's play. In my opinion, Yamana's technique is the best way to treat the patient with effekia. But uh, we saw some complications in a few patients. That's the reason why I changed the original technique. In this case, I want to show you a 42-year-old patient, male, single eye, with retinopathy of prematurity. Uh, retinal pump photocoagulated and with the dislocated lens. We began the surgery introducing uh, three valve trockers, 23 gauge. Then we continue opening the conjunctival uh, and then cauterize the zone because uh, at this zone uh, we construct two scleral pockets. I recommend prepare everything before opening the eye. It's very important try to insert the lens haptic into the needle lumen before opening the eye too. We mark two millimeters from the limbus and I use a, a square diamond knife presetting in 400 microns. The first incision uh, is perpendicular to the sclera and then we made the sclera pockets with the 23 gauge bilans and then with the needle we go to the vertex of the triangle pocket without cutting uh, moves 30 degrees and construct the scleral needle channel into the eye it's important to check to construct the other pocket opposite 180 degrees from the first pocket. Usually I only do uh, two incisions, one well, with a 15 degrees knife and the other one to, with a 2.4 millimeters. It's important to make uh, at 90 degrees from the scleral pocket. Then I continue with anterior vitrectomy and then with a posterior vitrectomy. Without vitreous in the arterial lens surface, it's easy to catch it with uh, only with vacuum of the vitrectum. I began lensectomy with the vitrector and holding the lens with the 25 gauge forceps. How it's so slow to me, I decided to exchange the vitrector by the FACO 
I performed the lensectomy in the anterior chamber uh, and I hold the lens fragments with the 25 gauge uh, micro forceps. If any little uh, fragment goes to the vitreous, it's not a problem for me because then I need to, to perform a, a posterior vitrectomy. Uh, I use the, the 3D system. It's easy for the anterior segment surgeons to, to saw everything. It's, it's changed my surgery. I complete with wide anterior vitrectomy in the place where the, the lens was placed. If it's that possible, I tried to insert the fair haptic uh, while the IOL was into the cartridge. It's more easy. This particular IOL have PBDF haptics. They are very strong haptics. I recommend begin this technique with this kind of IOLs. The second haptic was inserted using a 23 gauge forceps. As different as the original technique, I recommend exteriorize the haptics one at a time. Then we cauterize the haptic uh, without touching and make the flange haptic. At last we need to put the flange haptic into the square pocket. Then we close the conjunctival with absorbable suture and the surgery was finished. Well, that was really fantastic, Dr. Gerardo. And Thank the you. way you exteriorized the haptic, that was uh, really good. And uh, uh, I just want to know one thing from you that, you know, the way the lens, crystalline lens was handled, have you encountered problems like, you know, more bigger pieces of nucleus falling into the vitreous? Or um, are you primarily a retina person? And uh... Yes, it, it's a possibility, but it's not a problem because then I, I need to make a, a posterior vitrectomy. But another way is to, to extract all the nucleus with the uh, intracapsular surgery. Mm -hmm. I think that was a yeah. very smart trick where uh, he's uh, doing it beneath the flaps to overcome the chances yeah. of any exposure of uh, the end I, of the I, haptic. Have you, yes. Dr. Gerardo, encountered any issues with those, uh, uh, without making the flap, have you encountered any issues with the, uh, uh, with the haptic acting as a, uh, as, as a route towards uh, infection? Is it, is it that you have encountered it? Yes, the, the patient that I show is not mine, but it's from oh. another colleague in my country. The yeah. haptic extrusion in the, in the eye with the original Yamane and cause an endophthalmitis. Uh, I copy from Amar the IO glue, the, the pocket, or something like this. <laughs> it's a mix between two two techniques. I understand. Uh, yeah. So uh, you're securing your haptics with that. Yes, yes, yes. Because Preventing usually I, I make surgery in these cases in young people. I I try to uh, 20 years life or 30 years life more in this patient. Uh, Correct. I don't like the the bottom uh, near the conjunctival. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, Sergio, would you like to comment on this? I'm sorry, are you talking to me? Hello. Uh, yeah. Would you like oh. to put your comment on this, Sergio? You do a lot of uh, these cases. Uh, can I quickly comment, uh, Priya? Yes, sure, sir. Yeah, please. Please. Okay. Uh, Gerardo, uh, would you consider doing the lensectomy with a fragmentome? instead of going in with the FACO, I mean, you're going into the posterior chamber anyway. So would you like to do it with a fragmentum? Would that not be a more elegant way to uh, remove the lens? Yes. Sonal, can I, you also, I, Sonal Tuli, can you also come I in? I not use now the fragmentum. I, I used years ago. The retinal surgeon said that it's not good to, to eat a fragment of, 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 of lens near the retina because the US affect the retina. But in anterior chamber, it's, it's better the, the FACO, I think. I don't know. It's a beautiful uh, technique. Um, I like the, putting them under the scleral flaps because I do see the extrusions frequently. Um, I guess the question is, the, uh, the reason we put the needles in at the beginning of the case, um, you know, I was uh, cringing a little yeah. bit with them floating around trying to nick things uh, back there. Well, 
probably I change it. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I try to do with the 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 eye uh, without Ford, uh, yeah. decisions. Yeah. That it, it's better to construct. But probably next time I do first the vitrectomy and then I, I put the, the needle. Right. You are, you are, Dr. You are right. Yeah, there's a question for you. The audience wants to know that what kind of needle do you use and how do you actually bend it? Uh, again, please. The needle. Uh, what ah, needle, needle do you use? 30 gauge uh, thin wall. The, uh, as it is originally described by Shin. Yes, yes, yes. It's yes. the best. I, I began in my country because I, I don't have the 30 gauge thin wall with 27 gauge, but 30 gauge is, is better. Oh, fine. Yeah, perfect. So thank you, Dr. Gerardo, for that wonderful presentation. And the video audio was wonderful. And uh, for the benefit of the audience, uh, he runs a course which is called FACO Extrema. So he's basically a founder uh, of this course. And it is basically a course on challenging cases. So you can yeah. always be with him whenever you want to see those wonderful cases. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Gerardo. Thank and you uh, uh, Dr. Rohit Tom Prakash would now take over. Please, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I had the privilege of uh, inviting Dr. Ahmed, uh, who I believe is a friend to all, a brilliant academician, an excellent surgeon. He's from uh, Cairo. So he would be taking up a very interesting situation. I am stuck midway. What to do next? Over to Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to thank you all the panel of the All India Ophthalmic Society and the IIRS Society of India. So uh, let us start my presentation here. And okay. So you can see the screen now? Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. Good. So this is a case of a 38 uh, male presented with iatrogenic. Uh, aniridia and sublaxed cataract due to direct trauma to this eye and after posterior segment surgery, most probably it was vitrectomy to uh, treat the retina detachment. The original plan for this to treat this situation is to do the cataract extraction and IOL implantation with a Yamani technique and artificial iris. But because of the, some logistics and the patient is coming from abroad, we, try, we uh, agreed to split this procedure into two steps. The first step is the cataract extraction and IOL implantation with the Yamani technique. And later on, after the shipment of the artificial iris to arrive, we will do the uh, artificial iris fixed to the sclera. So in between, the patient will use the colored contact lens until uh, the artificial iris is available. So uh, this is uh, the case. This is the uh, strategy here. Now started with the cataract extraction. And uh, this is the uh, placement of the infusion. And the uh, anterior chamber maintainer, I'd like to use the Troker AC maintainer nowadays, two paracentesis, and uh, this is uh, marking the center of the cornea. There is no pupil here, as you can see, this, there is no, almost there is no iris tissue. And uh, starting the lensectomy with the uh, vitrectomy uh, probe uh, for the two paracentesis, and everything went just fine. This is 2.8 millimeter main incision, uh, preparing for the uh, mani technique. And this is the implantation of the three piece IOL inside the anterior chamber. And now I realized that I am stuck in a, in, a, in a very bad situation because there is no enough iris tissue to support the lens inside the anterior chamber. As you can see, the lens is about to fall down into the posterior segment of the eye. So I, I, I try to, to manipulate, okay, so we can proceed. Okay, I will hold the lens with the, my left, uh, with the, left, with the right hand and uh, insert the needle with the uh, left hand. And you can see the situation gets worse by the infusion uh, AC maintainer now has dislodged from the anterior chamber and the eye become very soft. So I had to replace it again and give it another chance trying to uh, feed this leading haptic inside the needle uh, with one hand while holding the lens in the other hand. Of course, I didn't have enough control or on the leading haptic to feed the haptic properly inside the needle. Uh, so what to do? This, I'm stuck this way. So I have to either to remove this lens with, through a larger incision in vitrectomized eye or trying to proceed to fix the lens uh, anyway to the sclera or whatever the technique is. So I'm, I'm, you can see that I'm trying, I'm trying and keep, keep trying out. out. I might ask this uh, third hand from the nurse, but her expertise was not 
enough to make me confident in her help. So I tried another time to try to, to uh, um, fix the IOL to the uh, needle or the sclera anyway. So I took the decision now to change the technique into the glued IOL technique. So you can imagine that I'm working now with one hand, working with a non-dominant head. I'm right-handed surgeon. I'm, I'm holding the lens with the right hand and I'm working now doing the sclera flap with one hand after the section of the conjunctiva. As you can see here, this is the flap. And of course it was not very pleasant situation. I was uh, not comfortable doing the uh, uh, glued IOL technique with one hand. And I didn't even use cautery because I'm trying to fix this IOL to the sclera as fast as possible. This is 1.5 millimeter uh, sclerotomy with the MVR. And now this is the micro forceps trying to externalize this leading haptic. And once I externalize this leading haptic, I can took my breath and I feel somehow relieved because now I can work bimanually as any other surgeon. So now just securing this haptic uh, and keep the trailing haptic outside the, uh, the eye and doing the flap on the other side you can see here, I'm doing the flap on the other side uh, after the section of the conjunctiva. And again, this is the uh, placing the trailing haptic inside the eye. And uh, I use the non-assisted technique uh, published by Priya uh, Narang, but just modified by keeping the shaft of the micro forceps underneath the trailing haptic to support it because there is no support from the iris tissue or whatever the capsule and just doing the handshake technique here and externalizing the trailing haptic. Of course, I have to secure the leading haptic and externalize the trailing haptic. So this is another advantage here. What I, I, I realized that we have another advantage because centration of these lenses is very critical because there is no pupil to mask or the, the, the centration of the lens because any amount of this centration of these lenses will be significant because of the absence of the iris tissue and so this is another uh, advantage of the uh, glued IL because the glue was not prepared in this case. So I opted to suturing the sclera flap and suture the conjunctiva. And you can see I got a nice centered lens. So my, what I've learned here that glued IL is better sometimes if the centration of the lens is very critical as well as if there is no enough iris support to do the Yamani technique. This is my insight, uh, insight in these cases. And the patient continued with uh, uh, colored IOL, uh, colored uh, contact lenses and the, uh, until the artificial iris uh, has uh, arrived in, uh, to the uh, OR. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. It was a beautiful presentation. I think it was you only who could have managed with a single hand. Uh, you know, we <laughs> hats off to you. Uh, Thank you. I would like to invite uh, the opinion of our esteemed panelist, uh, Dr. Namrata Sharma. How would uh, she? How would she have gone about with such a difficult situation, wherein the plan had gone uh, topsy turvy, and she had to he had to change the plan altogether? Dr. Namrata, please. So I'm not uh, very well versed with the Yamane technique, so I would have uh, used. Uh, Amar's uh, glued IOL technique to do this, and uh, of course he did. He did it very well. He made a uh, pocket there, sterile pocket there, while the IOL was still inside, which is very difficult to do with one hand. The entire thing, and as it is, when you enter the eye, and you have to make the, you have to do the sterile dissection later on. It's uh, it's very tricky because the eye becomes hypotenuse. Yeah, so, true. like you said, uh, Dr. Rohit Om Prakash, only he could do it. Otherwise, it's, a, it's again a tough thing to do. And there were many challenging situations. I mean, it, it was quite challenging, Dr. Ahmed Asa, what you have done uh, exactly because the, I was watching like this, like what's going on, like how you're going to do it because yes, that was a very sticky position where you couldn't go ahead and you had nobody to help you out with that. I think that's a very tricky thing, but then I think you managed very well by, and that was a very uh, judicious move by you to make one flap on one side and then externalize the haptic. And uh, the best part was the no assistant technique and I happened to see that you really used my technique and it really helped you out of the situation. So that was very nice to see. But I think overall it was very well managed. The only uh, concern about these cases, you know, when uh, the iris tissue is not there, uh, which is uh, the congenitally absent in these cases, uh, 
uh, how much time, uh, how much duration of follow up do you have of these cases? Because you know the uh, as iris tissue is not there around the uh, optic of the IOL, you know you might be having a vitreous coming up into the anterior chamber. So do you how is the status of the cornea or probably the uh, intraocular pressure of the eye? Uh, how how do you find this patient on follow up like? They're doing quite well. Uh, the, the cornea is okay. There is uh, the, the lens is away from the corneal endothelium. And there is no touch with the corneal endothelium. And uh, in this case in particular, there is no iris tissue. There is no weight for yes. the uh, optic capture, for example, in these cases in, the, in particular. But sometimes I had optic capture similar to the glued IL technique. And I, in these cases, I'm doing the uh, single pass for through, trying to minimize or bring the pupil down a little bit just to cover the optic of the eye and did it one or two uh, two times with the Yamani technique as well as with the glued IOL. So yeah. in general, uh, Yamani is okay, but uh, I, I feel that when centration of the IOL it should be guaranteed, I do believe that still the glued IOL is better regarding the centration of the optic of the lenses when the centration is critical, like the uh, premium lenses, or in these cases when there is no uh, pupil to mask uh, the decentration if uh, if minor decentration. So I do believe that still the glued IOL uh, is better for uh, th these cases. Uh, there is one suggestion from the audience. They have uh, they're saying that uh, they would have uh, fixed a suture loop into the distal haptic and secured it uh, to free the dominant hand. So that is uh, one of the suggestions which is coming up from the audience. Yeah, yes, one more uh, thing that uh, yeah, one more thing that uh, could have been uh, done was yeah. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I thought of this um, while doing the surgery and even to fix one of the stopper of the uh, iris hooks, but at, at that time it was not available. So we have to, to make to be quick in your reactions and trying to save the lens before falling down. So there are different solutions for this situation, of Correct. course. I, Correct. I do agree. Correct. Yeah. Which was the needle which you were using uh, for that matter? 28 gauge needle? Yeah. This is 28 gauge needle. We don't have the 30 mm -hmm. gauge needle uh, uh, as described by Shin Yamani, and this is the sensor AMO lens. Yeah, Doctor So, Doctor, thank you very much for the brilliant, uh, you know, exposition of uh, one-handed technique. I think uh, even <laughs> the, the great Doctor Amar would not have uh, thought about how it could have been managed in such a, such a short time. Over to Dr. Sonu for the next uh, presentation. Yeah, please. So thank you, SF, for showing that uh, amazing ambidexterity. So thank now you. I'll invite uh, a surgeon, a dear friend, and he's an ex surgeon par excellence, Sergio Kanabrava. And uh, I requested him uh, to uh, present uh, Kanabrava for flanged scleral fixation. So Sergio, welcome to India. Thank you, Gael. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for our organizer to invite me. A special thanks for Priya. Every time I say when I was in my first ASCIS, I was in the Priya uh, 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 meeting. And Priya was, and I, who is this girl? This girl uh, uh, work, uh, work, you know, uh, search a lot, man. And this uh, Priya uh, talked with me and my first time in the in USA, and thank you, Priya, for the invitation, and let's go to talk about the four flush technique. My pleasure, go. Sergio. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, today I will talk, uh, one minute, I need to screen my square, my... Uh. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. Yes? Okay, today I will talk about the fourth flange kind of brava technique. Here my disclosure about my presentation. And when did it all begin? Uh, in 2016, when I saw the Chin Yaman presentation and who uh, when the, he presented the, the flange. Then I have the idea to create the double flange when I use first a uh, haptic front IOL. And I publish it in the International Ophthalmology. He presented it in the ASIL Film Festival. But I was tossing. What I, I can to create a, 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 a adjustable suture. And then using a simple five zero pro lens suture, I create the double adjustable suture in late of 2017 and publish it in ASCIS in 2018 in a patient with um, Marfan syndrome. Okay, and present it in JCIS two. 
But about the fourth flange, date of 2018, I had the idea to modify the Yamani and the Malbron technique. And this is the first four flange technique that I use a simple 26 gauge needle. And I use a 5-0 proline sutra inside the lumen of the needle in one side. And then I use a single piece PMEAIOL and I insert it and I insert it in the eyelet of the PMEAIOL. Then I repeat the procedure in the other side. Again, a 5-0 prolent suture. Insert it in the eyelet of the IOL. And this part is important. You need to insert the IOL in the sucrose and a pronation movement. If you don't insert the IOL in the sucrose, you can have a tilt. Then after the IOL in the sucrose, the length will be okay. Then you cut about two millimeters from the basis of the, the scleral tunnel, and then repeat the procedure again. And then it's important. It's important to insert the, the flange inside the, the scleral tunnel to prevent, to avoid endophthalm meat and scleral conjugate. Okay, let's go. Then, Suggested we punch the hole the in the IOL well with a needle. To punch we remove the haptic optics. zone in each side of the. Then in my research, I presented uh, some ways to make a roll in the IOL, but I don't suggest it. I only presented a, a research. This is not is not safe. No, don't do it, please. The best way to use the four flange IOL with. A uh, uh, photo by OL is uh, IOL like Acros IOL. This is the video that I, I'm showing you the four flanged the photo by OL. You can use uh, Acros IOL or any IOL like this one. And you go and, and insert the ProLand here, a 6 0 ProLand, okay? And you insert the ProLand inside mm -hmm. the eyelets of the IOL. And you back only one side, only one side of the IOL. And instead of using a, a burrata forceps, when the IOL inside the eye, okay, in this position, you back the fourth point of the scleral fixation. Okay, then when you have the four points, when you have the four points inside the eye like this, you can do the first and the second uh, flange in the bottom of, after they do the, the first, the second, you can adjust with the IOL and you can do the third and the fourth flange and then insert the fourth flange inside the IOL. But is the end? No, only in 2019, the double flange, six, five surgeons uh, use the double flange suture to, to present different techniques then I think this, this kind of sutures uh, open a lot of uh, space for new techniques. And it's stable. Uh, to now, I have this number of patients. Of course, you need more follow-up to, to, to tell that it's not a problem. But to now, I have a good result. I'd like to invite you to, to watch the ASS Film Festival that I will present for the first time, a new design uh, of IOL that I manufacture with Moshe from German, uh, especially for the Ford Flange Technique. The, the movies are amazing, the ASIS Film Festival, virtual ASIS. And I'd like to invite you for the World, World Webinar on Cataract Refractive Surgery. Thank you for the invitation. Hear my Instagram follow surgeon and I'm here for question. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Can I just request you to stop share the screen? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. So I think four minutes is too short a time for you to present Sergio. You can present it for hours yes. and hours and we still keep learning from it. So what I, try, I try, I try to do it in five, four minutes. <laughs> I try it. <laughs> A quick comment from Dr. Sonal and Dr. Namrata, please. Can that was beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm amazed at how skillful that was and how much you, you um, innovate. Um, my question is, uh, you, since you bury the, the, the nubbins into the sclera, do you worry about them migrating because there really isn't a whole lot holding them in place? Can you repeat the, the internet, the, the sound is... 
Um, so the the question was, since you um, only have the, the the little loop and you have the the nubbins that you bury into the sclera, do you worry about them migrating or shifting? You uh, about the when you talk about the acros IOL. Yes. 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 Uh, till now, I am following this patient with, uh, uh, with UBM, and I do it about 2.5 millimeters from the labels to make the to to put the IOL uh, back and to 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 avoid it. Uh, but as I told in the end of the presentation, you need to uh, to keep studying. And we started this three years ago, and uh, I, I I know a lot of surgeons like to do the technique but it's important to wait the, the the papers to to say what is to do and what not to do that's but it's a sensible. good question thank you no thank you for, for, for that Sergio, that was a great presentation the only thing i wanted to ask was when you do it with a with a four point fixation acrius lens vis-a-vis -vis when you do it with a pmma lens do you think there's any difference between the two in terms of decentration or in terms of stability of the lens? The four points. The four points is, is more stable because you have four points and, and the, the, the I.O. stay like this. And in this moment, I don't finish my work, but in this moment, I suggest to use the four points because you can use a 3.4 millimeters corn incision. You need to do a scleral uh, core, a scleral incision, and is more stable. But the PMMA IOL is is a good option too. But you need to insert you need to insert the IOL in the sulcus. If you don't insert the IOL in the sulcus, is you can you can produce a, a tilt IOL tilt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sergio, one more uh, clinical question I just wanted to ask you, that when uh, you have all the uh, sutures coming up in a, uh, in a in a four plant fixation, so uh, how much is the amount of suture that you would pull and then cut it off and then create a flange? Because you need to titrate the lens, otherwise, you know, uh, if all four of them are of a different uh, thing, is, suppose if one is a bit longer and the other is a bit shorter, it might induce. So is there a trick in doing that? How would you do yes, that? yes, yes. Uh, with the PMMA, first I do one side plus, please. First, okay, I okay. do one side, and you need to uh, sensibility. You you pull one side, and I I cut about two millimeters from the base, okay, about two millimeters the, the base, and I hold it with a micro forceps to entry gauge uh, forceps, okay, and again I, I repeat the movement in the other side. And uh, when you 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 be it's okay. I cut up again two millimeters, and the acros IOL is okay because you do first the bottom, and when you do the bottom, you have the 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 top uh, problem to adjust it, and you can okay. adjust to it. It's okay. Okay. Uh, that, that 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 was the first uh, tip, like that. That was a great tip, clinical. I think it was a wonderful video. Thank you. Uh, Sergio, a quick question for the benefit of the audience. What is the suture material that you're using and what is the cautery? Can you just specify uh, for the general benefit uh, what cautery can they use? Any, any prolen suture. Uh, the prolen suture, for example, in Brazil, the price, the cost of the prolen suture is $3. Any prolen sutures. And this 5-0 in uh, prolen suture is 10 times more thicker and a, a hundred times more hesitant that a uh, 10 0 prolen suture then my my idea how uh, the the 10 0 prolen suture photo degradation in 7 to 10 years if it this this 5 0 is 10 times thicker i think it can and uh, can photo degradation with 40 or 50 years uh, ago and uh, yes yeah, the 5 0 prolen suture and echo johnson echo johnson okay. so so thank you, uh, yes. Sergio, for that thank presentation. Thank you. Priya, I'm Yes, so we now move on to our next uh, speaker, the next presentation coming up from our uh, very own uh, Dr. Partha Biswas, sir. Uh, no need to uh, mention much about him. He's the chairman of Scientific Committee, All India Ophthalmic Society, and he's also the director of VB Foundation. So we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Priya, and uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here at this uh, webinar. And uh, I'll go directly to a very difficult situation where we land up with the PCR and the intraocular lens implantation, all the benefits that we can give to a patient with typical and atypical presentations. 
So let us see what uh, presentations it can be. When, if a posterior capsular rexis of a PCR is not possible or is impossible. So let us look at a situation in which when it is quite impossible, it's a very large posterior capsular rupture and we have a large nucleus. So the OVD comes in as a tool and what we need to do is to separate out here, even a scaffold of the IOL is a good tool to use and to remove this amount of uh, cortical matter along with the nucleus is can be done very well. And once it is done, then the intraocular lens can be placed in the sulcus, a three piece lens. The vitreous, if it is there in the anterior chamber needs to be taken out and tricot assisted vitrectomy is the rule. So with removal of the vitreous, uh, a nice round pupil and the job is made. This is usually what we do in most of the circumstances. But let us look at a few other circumstances. And when the PC tear is small and a posterior capsular rexis fashioning that out of the posterior capsular rupture is possible. So here we have a situation where we have done the job and then suddenly I notice that there is a small posterior capsular rupture which is quite central. So the OVD goes in and to make a small and a very circular posterior capsular excess is what needs to be done. And once that is done, then this bag which has ruptured is actually a strong and a stable bag. So with that out, and a nice PCC that has been carved out, uh, intraocular lens, a single piece intraocular lens can be placed inside the bag. But of course, let us remember that there could be a tag of the vitreous even in such an instance and uh, tricot assisted vitrectomy as and when required is the rule and needs to be done. So let us look at uh, the third situation. And here a situation is there a posterior capsular excess is again not possible, but can an intraocular lens be placed in the back? So here, this is a very typical case in which, in which uh, it was a posterior polar cataract and there's a rip right transverse from side to side. Can we place an intraocular lens, a single piece intraocular lens in the bag? Well, here I'll, I'm going to stop a while and suggest that this is a very tricky situation. In such a case, what has to be determined is there, is, there should be absolutely no vitreous mingled between the ruptured posterior capsule and the anterior capsular rim. If a space can be brought by the OVD separating the anterior capsular axis from the ruptured posterior capsule, then it is important that it is possible that we can place a single piece lens even in this torn posterior capsule. So let's see how it is. it goes about. So we land the single piece lens on the iris. And that is a very, very important thing. And then what we need to do is to very gently bend the knuckle of the, the leading haptic and squeeze it in between the anterior capsule and the ruptured posterior capsule. This has to be done under direct visualization. And once this is done and we are sure that it has gone into place, same way the trailing haptic is also gradually placed between the torn posterior capsule and the anterior capsular rim. And this has to be done with total visualization. If at any point of time there is a collapse of the anterior capsule to the posterior capsule and the lens and the haptics cannot be placed, then this is not the technique to be done. And then it is only a three piece lens that should be brought into the sulcus. I show my last video, and it is again a very similar situation. Here again, it is a posterior polar cataract and we have ruptured the posterior capsule. The uh, uh, cortical matter is removed very gradually. Cortical matter is removed. What we do find is the 
importance of the OBD in such circumstances. And uh, there is a posterior capsular rupture. Again, it is a total rip of the posterior capsule. This time it is longitudinal, and this time it is a lot more trickier because it is eccentric. That is one part is actually small and the other part is quite large. So again, the same technique is followed and the single piece lens is landed over the iris, twirled around and then under direct visualization with a blob of OVD separating the anterior capsule to the ruptured posterior capsule, the first haptic is placed in. It is seen that it has nicely gone in, a push test is done and then when one is totally sure, then from, with the other uh, side, the trailing haptic is then placed again in between the ruptured posterior capsule and the anterior capsule. This technique cannot be done in every circumstance that we show, but if there is a good space that can be delineated anatomically by the OVD between the ruptured posterior capsule and the anterior capsular rim, then this technique is a very good technique for an intraocular lens single piece in the back, even in a ruptured posterior capsule. Thank you very much for your patience here. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patterson, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And I think there were uh, great clinical tips in all the cases that you had come up with, you know, handling the nuclear fragment, handling the vitreous, spacing the intraocular lens and all that. So uh, uh, anything uh, differently that uh, you would like to do into this? Uh, Dr. Gaurav, could you put your, some inputs into this? I think... Uh... Hi, Priya. So I think uh, Partha showed some amazing uh, tips and, uh, you know, he was able to, you know, highlight how you can create space and adequate use of viscoelastic and then the maneuvers in which you can actually do that. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can uh, actually do optic captures of various kinds as well. You know, doing a capture with a single piece lens is uh, very much more challenging because, you know, at the optic haptic junction, it tends to kind of, you know, sometimes twist. So if you have a very tight rexis, sometimes it will not capture well. But, uh, you know, there is an art to do it and you can do a posterior or an anterior capture. Of course, making sure that the single piece haptics are always behind the anterior capsular rim. You cannot allow them to remain anterior to that. Otherwise, they're going to cause complications. But I think uh, Partha showed some excellent tips and I'm sure somebody else would like to add yeah. anything. Dr. Vipika, would you uh, like to say something? Yeah, Dr. Rajesh, you know, please. Yeah, basically in posterior polar cataract, whenever there's a rip, it rips throughout, through and through. So if you have just a rip and... Uh, vitreous has not come in, it, it has not created a larger opening, yes, carefully we can manage and put a single piece lens in the bag and what's, that's what Dr. Partha showed. Uh, but if it has ripped quite a lot and there's a larger opening, then these capsules are little, uh, a little floppy in, in the sense that they're a little lax. So it's uh, better, as Gaurav was telling, it's better you put a multi-piece lens in the sulcus and uh, do an optic capture. So this is what I normally do, but it was very nicely done. And that's what I said that if the rip is linear and it's not extending, creating too much of space, yes, you can go ahead and put an IOL in the bag. Yeah. And Dr. Ritika, would you like to do something differently? Um, and I the vitreous think... should not be there in between the anterior capsule and the ruptured posterior capsule. That is very important. It's A very, very important. good space by the OVD, our, our dispersive yeah. viscoelastic that separates out anatomically that space between the anterior capsule and the posterior rupture capsule is very right. important. Dr. So, in fact, what Rajesh said, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, sure. Ritika, please. Uh, no, Dr. Vinod was wanting to yeah. highlight the point, just yeah. wanted to get him. Yeah, uh, thank you. In suspected cases, uh, I think having an oval capture also helps a lot. If you're having an oval capture, it helps uh, you. Uh, oval capsule rexes, it helps to have a good capture and you have a enough space in sulcus you want to place any less you can do it there or you can easily do capsule rupture also. I think that's a good thing if you can manage. Yes. yes. Dr. Pansa, there's a quick question for you. Um, audience is asking that uh, what kind of OVD do you use between the anterior and the posterior capsule, especially when it is ruptured? Yeah. So dispersive viscoelastic is what I use and uh, it is important uh, to see that it is only the dispersive viscoelastic that is going on and uh, is actually separating out so as to tamponade the break as much as possible and not let the vitreous come in. But of course, if the vitreous mingles out, the first thing that has to be done is a vitrectomy without 
you know, manipulating too much of the vitreous because of the problems of the posterior segment, the traction on the vitreous base, okay. which definitely needs to be avoided. Dr. Sonal, a comment from you? Sonal, yeah. Sorry, that was beautiful. Um, beautiful techniques and very controlled maneuvers, which, is, which all of us should learn from. Um, my question was that the optic you're keeping on top of the anterior capsule, is that correct? No. Or are you putting the, the optic the, and the haptic in the bag? In the bag, in the bag, right. in the bag. In the bag. yes. In the bag, the, okay. Uh, we land the optic on the iris and then manipulate the haptic first in between the bag, means the ruptured posterior capsule and the anterior capsule, and then the trailing haptic also, and thereby the optic settles down in the bag. Into the bag. Okay. okay. Yes. I have one question. Why don't you put a three-piece and then capture it? Don't you think it will be probably yeah. more stable, more <laughs> simple? That's what I'm asking. Yeah. So <laughs> what, for I small, guess, small PCRs, I, I understand you can still, you know, get away with it. But with the yeah. ones which are larger, the, yeah. I think that is a more stable solution. Yeah, it is the simplest and it is the most stable solution as well. Uh, however, this can be done and uh, we tried it and uh, it worked and uh, the, uh, the PC and uh, the anterior capsule remains stable and it actually, that hammock actually captures the, both the haptics quite well. So once it has gone directly in, so the hammock actually, uh, and uh, with time, it also fibrosis and thereby the capture is quite good. However, if there is any doubt that it is not possible, it is always safest and simplest to put it uh, three piece in the sulcus and capture it. So I think what Rajesh said was absolutely right. These posterior polars, the capsule is not healthy. Mm. When it rips, it's very difficult yeah. to pull it around and make get a excess. And you know, it extends very fast. In fact, they usually go end to end. And uh, even if at the time when you're implanting the lens, it's not ripped to the edge, you know, by the time you finish putting in the lens and doing your yeah. manipulations, it would have extended and then, you know, it's so there is a risk. And if you are putting the lens in the bag, you know, it may be great to just anterior capture the optic if you can. And then, you know, but you manage so beautifully that it looked really nice, Partha. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Partha, for that wonderful presentation. Thank you. So, Pratika. Uh, we now invite Dr. Gaurav Lutra, the leading surgeon, uh, one of the leading surgeons of the country and uh, uh, of the force behind many academic programs of IRSI. So, uh, over to you, Dr. Gaurav. The, he'll be showcasing his presentation. Now you see it, now you don't. Okay. Thanks, Ritika. And uh, thanks, uh, all the moderators and the organizers, for inviting me to be here amongst such uh, brilliant surgeons. And I'll try to show you something, and please don't you know, pull my leg too much. It's a complication which I wanted to share with you. And it's actually a learning, um, you know, video where we learned how not to make certain mistakes. And I thought it was very relevant with some of the new techniques that we are, uh, you know, coming into. So In we fact, it's something that... Very, uh, we are going to some, see very carefully now. Gaurav. Yeah, please do. And, you know, there's something that Ritika has been showing and I've been doing for about a year and getting away very nicely. But one time I got stuck and I wanted to share that. So, uh, okay. So I had this, uh, you know, elderly patient who's almost 85. Uh, he's one-eyed. His fellow eye has had three grafts and, uh, you know, the third time it failed and he has, uh, that eye has uh, only, a, you know, perception with uh, accurate projection and that eye was lost. So it was uh, gone. And the second eye, he patient used to have about 624 vision, had been advised to undergo a combined procedure for almost three years, but he was so scared of doing anything that he kept deferring it. And by the time we got to operate upon him, he was finger counting one meter and less. So he was not willing for a PK, which had been advised for almost three years because this was his only eye. And he had had three grafts and he said, this one will fail and I will be gone. So finally, at this point, he said that even if I can get two or three lines of vision, which he had before the cataract progress, we decided to go ahead after a lot of explaining, he was only willing for a cataract surgery. So now maybe you guys have guessed what we did because of what Ritika has been showing about dancing in the dark kind of stuff and then how we had a situation. So we went with the chandelier and uh, it actually works very beautiful and we've done uh, five, six cases like that. And so I was very confident that this would, uh, you know, do well because uh, the opacity was not so bad that, uh, you know, it would preclude the view completely and the chandelier really helped. And you can see that we got a beautiful view for the excess. So we 
went ahead with the hydro dissection, which again happened nicely. We have a nice, good enough pupil size, and uh, I was doing well. And then suddenly there was darkness, and guess what? The chandelier had slipped out, and as it slipped out, the pupil became smaller, and we had a situation. And uh, so managed to open the hooks. Then we'll go back and finish it. And as we started doing, uh, we had a nucleus drop because the chandelier probably had done a lens touch. And uh, so this was like a big shock for me because uh, suddenly we had a situation where uh, you know the nucleus was gone and there was an opaque cornea. And this was almost 9 p.m. and our retina team was home and sleeping probably. So I had to quickly call them in. Uh, I by the time the retina guys came, I managed to do. Uh, and they attracted me and uh, tried to clear up whatever cortex i could and since the iris hooks were in place so uh, by the time in 10 15 minutes uh, you know the retina team came over to take over and the view was terrible because you can imagine that we were using a chandelier with a very bad cornea and uh, the view from one small edge of the cornea we could get a view of the retina and under topical anesthesia itself we thought we'll try to see whether you know we need to enhance the anesthesia but luckily you know we could even go ahead with the Uh, you know three port uh, vitrectomy uh, the chandelier was already in place so one port was already there and uh, we managed to get the nucleus out at that setting and you can see how bad the cornea is and uh, at this point once everything was taken care of we decided to close the surgery we did not plan to put in a lens at that point although the rim was intact and uh, seven weeks post op you know the patient had improved the cornea had improved but the, it was bad enough that we had to obviously now the patient was convinced to go ahead he did get some vision you know he was able to see finger counting 2 meters but that was not enough for him so we went ahead with the you know a graft and uh, along with that uh, we managed to put in a lens into the sulcus and uh, it was not me operating here it was a cornea surgeon and here we put in a lens and so namrata is smiling and i can see that she's going to you know pull me up on this and we managed to finally get a situation where the graft was completed and next day you know this was post op few few days later and patient eventually settled down he now has about 6 uh, 36 vision and um, i'll stop sharing it here so now go ahead and tell mm-hmm. me how badly i did and how what i could have done now the problem was that if the chandelier hadn't slipped you know we could have probably uh, got away nicely and then you know that whole thing complicated the case and what would you have done if uh, you know first thing is tips that why chandelier how it, you know you might want that it should not slip out like that and maybe i'll come back later what we improvise later on and then what we could have done at that point itself all corneal uh, surgeons are smiling marshall god okay. <laughs> god of just a couple of things i know i know i purposely got this case Dr. because Dr. Namurda, you know can take over it was a learning thing for over. us and <laughs> Yeah. Like right first, I'll uh, I'll yeah. slaughter you. Then number no, second. No, no. <laughs> Actually, I must t- tell you that you know you are very brave that you are showing this case. I mean, I we all yes. we we won't do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. We I understand. All, that, we that's all have I'm faced it. in our clinical practice such scenarios. We all have faced whoever does can have such things. And chandelier, believe me, I had first seen uh, one uh, surgery. Uh, shown by Dr. Mahipal, and then after that, I used chandelier, and chandelier really works very well. Gives such a nice view of rexes and everything. So shows beautifully. So what you did was absolutely fine, but something had happened. So it was really unfortunate that it happened. But I must compliment the retina surgeon. Uh, who was that? Was it Sora or Sora? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He had a very so, tough time, you know. And yeah. we, there was a small window through which you know he was using these side. Yeah, excited. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He also did a fantastic job. And then of course, uh, finally, uh, I mean, all is well that ends well. So. Yeah, but you I, know the problem we had was I could have easily done this case without the chandelier, but frankly, chandelier makes life so easy. Oh, Why I wanted yeah. to show this case was that you know mm-hmm. we show this. My doctor Maipal has shown this so beautifully. Yeah. Ritika has shown yeah. it. Everybody, yeah. you know, I want to tell the average surgeon that you know things look really nice when we do them well, but you know some things can go wrong. And I'll tell Absolutely. you why we we how we realized that I could have done that case very nicely without it because you know my with just with the end illuminator showing from the outside yeah. like Ashwin showed, yeah. I could have. We, we do these such cases very routinely even otherwise anyway what i felt was that what had happened was we had fixed the endo illuminator in the infra temporal mm. quadrant you know where mm. there is no support for the tubing to be supported on anything typically ideally i should have placed it in the infra nasal quadrant mm. where there was a nose and everything to support and that's why you know there was no support for the tubing and while it would have lasted and you know we've done it before and it always works 
yet because this patient had a very high nose and there was very little room for me to you know kind of uh, you know approach the pots from the intranasal for this time i made it intro temporal and i learned my lesson because you know the moment it just you know the tubing slipped a little bit and it just popped out i was not looking at it my mm-hmm. assistant should have been more careful to see that this was gradually losing its kind of bearing or whatever so that was one thing which i learned second thing i thought was that you know don't use it unless it's absolutely necessary and frankly you know retina surgeons probably use it every day so they will probably be more conversant with it but this is one complication which can happen and if it suddenly slips out you know it can cause uh, you know lens touch so yeah. i think and then it can really complicate the situation you, i had a retina surgeon a, to call you, back on yeah if you uh, you know a, otherwise yes otherwise things would have been difficult but if you have a posterior capsular tear in the presence of a corneal opacity that's a big it's a huge problem exactly and coupled with that if you have a drop then it's a complete disaster exactly. because uh, then you know your uh, retinal surgeons also give up he couldn't give up because for obvious reasons there was no choice he was a one eyed patient one-eyed yes patient. Yeah. Uh, dr gora there is a suggestion one of the audience uh, they are saying yeah sorry yeah the, the, there's a suggestion that probably uh, from dr vipul prajapati he's saying that uh, it's better to choose up a manual sics for this case is it yeah probably sics would have been great for this patient but still won't solve the proper patient's corneal issues and yes i completely agree for but I, what i but what i feel is if this patient was being operated by an expert sics surgeon he would have probably preferred to do sics an expert phaco surgeon will still probably feel more conversant doing this because in their hands mm-hmm. sics may be so either refer it off to which i often do we have a good sics surgeon uh, sics surgeon in the clinic i sometimes refer my black brown cataracts with bad corneas and stuff to him and they do a good job so good suggestion no no but i guess you made a very good choice and fortunately yeah. these things can happen in anybody's hands so god is looking till the time of capsular exit it was looking very good yeah but, but i think <laughs> yeah half way through eventually it was managed very well with the pk and uh, with the uh, iol in yeah. and it it did well that was the that is the bottom line and that should it be so gaurav ritika you want to put your input you want to dr maipal is dr maipal wants to pull me gaurav you should have asked your brother to be there to put in the chandeliers and be there all the time i don't mess <laughs> and the second is you should have done it under a block so i don't know why you were trying to do i okay so with intracameral anesthesia you know i typically operate almost all my complicated cataracts i don't use blocks because i feel it's more controlled for me and i'm both more comfortable even with the more complex cases so all the same uh, you know the lessons learned and uh, yes you know maybe it for for for, uh, for take home message should be that uh, for take home message should be that we should do under blocks yes so but um, you know that is so hazy and the patient can't fixate it is always best to do it under a block because if you tell him don't look this side or look that side he is not going to listen because he has no vision he wouldn't know where to look even right. opaque cataracts sometimes the bells phenomena is so strong they can't fixate under topical anesthesia so you know totally opaque cataracts yes it's very very challenging and i agree that you know um, typically blocks may be good you just don't like to give blocks that's all with the new trocar cannula actually uh, the uh, chandelier is pretty much self retaining and we can actually i know hindsight has perfect vision but you can actually use a tape to fix it it's yeah. very difficult for the assistant to see that it's loosening up because you're operating in the dark yeah. so yeah. it's difficult so but of course so uh, do you guys typically put it in the intranasal quadrant or do you sometimes you know change uh, that to the intro temporal we, we have thing? changed it but we, we normally use self retaining trocar cannula system with the uh, Uh, it's not happened of course uh, yeah. it can happen in one eye you be block always and surgical tape can be used just to fix it because if there is too much movement and you have to know that the room is dark so the uh, assistant will not be noticing because you switched off uh, we normally switch off the light in the room to enhance yes. the visualization under the chandelier yes. yeah and dr girardo you do a lot of posterior segments so uh, surgery so yeah. you want to give your inputs regarding this who are you asking Dr Gerardo I think yes it's mute Gerardo yeah <laughs> I now again please yeah uh, I wanted to ask you Dr Gerardo yeah the you do a lot of posterior segment surgeries so you, uh, would you like to give any your opinion regarding uh, the previous case that you just saw from Dr Gaurav uh sorry but I I'm I saw a patient yet I don't saw the the video oh, okay. I'm so sorry I think Dr Chi okay. wants to say something probably sorry. I think she's been wanting to chip in Dr Chi what you wanted to say anything no I thought you were anyway so no, no, no. something Ashwin Ashwin wants to say something Ashwin you do a lot of things 
Sonal but, wants to say something. I I just felt that what Gaurav uh, showed was was reality, and I think a lot of us face this in uh, our day to day practice sometimes. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, we learn from such uh, videos because I know I face this a lot of times. And uh, I mean complications. Uh, once it goes spiraling down, then uh, you just have to pause for a second and minute and probably reassess the situation instead of panicking and. asking or screaming and those things happen in the or yeah. all of us face that so that's something that i think i learned from all of you experts uh, what like tell i have no comment i just want to learn from this whole thing <laughs> dr parth oh, I, i think i want to learn too and this is beautiful work uh, the only other thing i comment i would make is i try to optimize everything i can before i do the cataract surgery so that cornea even though it was horrible <laughs> there were certain areas that you could have, you know so doing a little chelation doing a little um surface ablation maybe or um scraping might have helped your view a little bit so wouldn't have solved the problem but uh, you know putting viscoelastic on the cornea just to smooth that surface a little bit uh, just make your life a little easier that we typically do but good suggestion about you know kind of doing something to minimize the haze uh, in advance that would have helped i'm sure thank you gorov i think it speaks of your peace of patience of mind and your balanced mind because that is what is important in these challenging situations challenging situations thanks thanks so, a lot uh, okay. dr rajesh yeah next we have uh, professor chi who is professor at national university of singapore snec singapore and she will be presenting on a subluxated cataract let's have uh, professor chi i hope you can see my screen yes yes is it okay yeah. yes yeah okay Yeah so first of all I'd like to thank Sonia and the organizers for inviting me to participate and I just want to share with you a patient that I thought was challenging she's challenging cuz she's a doctor and quite an aggressive one but as you will see the case I found that there are more challenges than just having to handle a doctor so she studied a left subluxated crystalline lens and on UBM we saw zonular loss for 7 clock hours So I decided that femto was the best way to go, and this is the time I was using the Victus. And you can see here, actually, the lens is not the center, and there's something here, and the reflex is looking funny, and the chamber is really very shallow. The lens is pushing forwards; it's tilted. So we proceed with fragmentation after the capsulotomy, and said, "Well, oh, what's that? Is that Victus? I had made my presentation away from where the zonular area." was and yet which just came to view so i was not anticipating that because the ubm somehow didn't show me that right so i worried because it's 7 o'clock hours that i'm missing and if i'm going to start doing vitrectomy to take out that which is i might drop that lens let it tilt backwards so i have to get a hook in first i have to make sure my capsulotomy is complete and then i put in diluted trimsinone and then i do the vitrectomy from the posterior approach and trying to remove the vitreous round here is not really quite the simplest thing to do because it's where you don't really see very well but once i've gotten rid of that vitreous thanks to trimsinol that showed me exactly where the vitreous was you can see with the hooks to support the capsule we can then see very nicely that this lens is really quite wobbly and i elected to put in a capsule tension ring right away all right so you can see that inside the bag and it's important to just have the viscoelastic under the capsule and here there's a bit of synechia here which i released because the lens was really pushed forward severely and now this is a soft lens in a 38 year old doctor so aspiration i thought was the safest way to go it took a little long because this is not really the softest of lenses but i was so worried about her and i really didn't want anything to go wrong you know i just remember how aggressive she was okay so i'm finishing it i'm removing all the the cortical material you can see trimsinol behind the ol it's hard to get this ol in it's through a 4.2 mm capsulotomy because that was the center but here i'm enlarging it only after the ol goes in yes it's safe to enlarge it even when you have got ctr in place all right so even if you have a pcr it does not rip open so i have to fixate this i'm using a suture snare with a cortex 70 oh, right through a twin six gauge needle putting it on the CTS once i've loaded it on the CTS insert it into the capsule bag i'm doing this first to see exactly where i should be best placing it all right this centers the ol so i'm placing 1.75 mm uh, mm mark there so that i dissect the pocket 
uh, Hoffman pocket beyond that mark and then using the prepared uh, angled uh, suture snare, I then come forward with that suture and I take a loop out and thread through the end of the suture that's loaded onto the CTS. I now repeat this procedure, taking care not to puncture this capsular bag that I've taken so much pains to preserve. And then with that little suture snare, I then snare the end of the other uh, end of the suture loaded on the CTS. Using a Sinsky hook, I then hook the sutures that are passing through the full thickness sclera from the pocket. And once I've got the RL well centered, I look at the RL, not the rexus. Uh, you do a 2 one, one uh, knot and then put it back into the Hoffman pocket. So at the end, we have to make sure that there's no vitreous and there is none indeed here. And I'm just going back again to remove more of that vitreous now that I've got the RL well stabilized and centered. So this is the end of the case. And this patient did well. She opted to have a bit of myopia so that she could read her notes easily. Thank you for watching. Professor Chi, that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I must say that you did everything in and exactly how uh, the way that it should be taught to your residents. And I mean, that was mind blowing, I must say. And uh, I, I just want to ask you one thing that uh, have you shifted to Gore-Tex for all these uh, fixations or um, do you use proline also? Or? No, I use only Gore-Tex. Um, I think for the last four years also, I've been 100% Gore-Tex. Okay. I hardly use proline because I can't seem to get the right 9-0 proline with the right needle, yeah, the right combination. So I found it's really very good, but it's important that your Hoffman pocket is really dissected in a deep enough plane so that your knot is well buried and you don't get an exposure in the granuloma formation. So see, that was like a textbook-like picture, you know, explaining everything on how to manage such cases. Very nice educational you. video, very nice. Thank you. Well, sir, any quick comments from you, sir? Yeah, so basically, I think uh, it's always a pleasure to see the surgery of uh, Dr. Chi. It's uh, really fantastic. Uh, and I think she's a master of fixing the, the uh, gap tool with rings and hooks and everything. The important thing that I'll just wish to highlight is that uh, having what we call as the third hand or the pars plana approach to initially take away the vitreous and uh, <laughs> So the imaging that you get on the OCT of a femto is really fantastic. Whether you are looking at the uh, posterior polar or in this particular case, you could easily see that uh, that there was a blurb and uh, that is how the vitreous looks. So uh, you may miss it at the UBM as she did, but on the OCT when you are doing it at the time of the docking, uh, you can easily see that what the uh, vitreous is looking like. And what is very important is that instead of tackling it from the front part, that she has tackled it from the pars plana. So what that does is that it decompresses the whole thing, and uh, the quantum of the uh, the uh, the zonular dialysis and the vitreous coming up goes down, and you are not hydrating the vitreous if you do it from the front. So that is very very important. Then she put in the uh, after the vitrectomy, she put in the uh, endocapsular ring to again push it, and she had the uh, a capsular hook. So what was done was actually classical textbook and that is the best way to actually go ahead and do that. So I think uh, great learning tips uh, from uh, Dr. Chi as always and I think that's how we should uh, handle such cases. And uh, I would prefer a femto in all such cases uh, where you have this kind of a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I just want to highlight that, you know, even if you have a CTR that's already sitting there comfortably. It's okay to even start to initiate, to enlarge that rexus and to center it. I used to fear doing that. But, you know, I had a case where I inadvertently had a posterior capsule rupture when the PC came up because of misdirection of fluid right behind the capsule. And it just caused that little uh, PCR, but it did not just rip. And that taught me a lesson because I could then convert that little opening into a PCCC and made it even safer after that. But you don't need to fear, all right, if you have a CTR in place that if you were to give a rexis a little snip that it would just rip. It wouldn't. It has not in many of my cases. I think that's So I, I would rather enlarge, you know, the, the capsulotomy in these cases. That was a wonderful tip. And Dr. Chi, I had a question for you. You know, inadvertently, you did an amazing job. So I was just for the 
take home message for somebody who's watching like when you go and do the vitrectomy behind you know it's very important probably not to do more than what is absolutely necessary to just get the vitreous out if you do a little bit of an extra vitrectomy what can happen is that the posterior support is lost and then you know it can dip it start dipping down even more that's happened to me once long back and i've been very careful just to do that little bit of a vitrectomy that is required to just get the vitreous out of the way and not overdo it kind of thing yeah. yes you know, Absolutely. There is a there is a question that Dr. Chi. Uh, uh, the uh, there is a question. They want to know that whether whether there are any chances of not exposure of gotex. Exposure of gotex it can happen, right? If you do not dissect that sterile pocket deep enough. So I usually use a guarded diamond blade that goes at least three hundred microns deep into the the limbal area and then dissect backwards. And when you dissect. Uh, you should not start to see blood because the moment you start to see blood on the conjunctiva, it means that you're coming superficial. Okay, that's a sign that you can actually just go back, open up the incision that you created, and then dissect a new tract deeper. Okay, so you never want to have a knot in a, a very superficially placed flat. Gaurav, what you are saying uh, under those circumstances, whenever you are putting this, uh, you are going from the past plane. You can always put the infusion on. So you know, uh, I understand. Uh, yeah. In spite of that, sir, what happens is that if you kind of uh, over, then you have to keep it on through the procedure, and you know you have to make sure that yeah. you're keeping the equilibrium. Yeah, you otherwise it uh, can. In a approach, so you uh, you shouldn't take out the infusion cannula, I suppose, yeah. till the absolutely. The absolutely. And because you might want to do a vitrectomy right at the end, also at that particular time, if there is that, you can then go in from the front part. to remove uh, so basically uh, you should keep the uh, for the support also you could keep the infusion on absolutely very very good tip sir so gar what what i want to emphasize is that you know before i did the vitrectomy i actually put a hook on the rectus mm -hmm. okay that's to make sure that when i start to cut the lens does not tip backwards because i really don't know with all the femtoe marks you know you know i can see that well to see how close the vitrectomy port is to my posterior capsule that's always the frightening part right. okay so yeah. i i i just put a hook to make sure it stayed in the anatomical position and did not change position as i did the cutting so yeah. you one question i think that was uh, very very useful the right thing to do sorry okay i just want to ask uh, why did you tie the ctr at this stage couldn't you have delayed it with capsular hooks in place somewhat delayed it rather than it up front you have started uh, you with the ctr okay so it's been my practice to put in the ctr right at the outstart because it pushes the equator out and it keeps it there i've had times especially in cases with severe zonulitis you have four hooks and in between the equator comes all right because you only have four broader points than a iris hook definitely which does not support even the equator but it's it's in between because these are cases of severe zonulitis so this is 7 clock hours if i just support two points in between i will get the the equator coming when i do the phaco or the aspiration mm -hmm. so i always put it at the outstart and you will see that i do not ever trap cortex okay so the the the, the trick really is before you put in the ctr to pick up that clean plane Well, it's devoid of cortex just under the anterior capsule, and once you've got into that plane, you keep injecting viscoelastic and then sweep that around for about four to five clock hours. And once you inject the CTR into that, it will skirt around in the same plane and generally does not trap cortex. So, in cases wherein the subluxation is say till ninety degree or so, or maybe till one hundred twenty degrees, so in that you can do away with. implanting ctr up front yes i do it for all my cases even for yes. even for minimal uh, subluxations yes okay. i like to do that as a first step so i suppose i get a lot of practice from that you know trying not to trap the cortex and i think because that that plane is really dissected quite well you know uh, unlike what others teach that you might make the zonulitis worse or lose more zonules this The CTR skirts around so smoothly because the bag is held distended, and I've got viscoelastic in that plane to really allow the CTR to move very smoothly without getting snagged on the capsular bag. Furthermore, if you have severe zonulitis, if you have got hooks there to support your bag, it doesn't matter whether you 
inject your CTR from intact to non-intact or vice versa. Because as long as you've got the support, your lens doesn't move, it's fine. So I found, you know, these teachings, yes, they're true. You don't have anything to support your capsular bag that you must inject from intact zonules to non-intact. But once you've got the support there with hooks there, it doesn't matter which direction you inject. So that's the most important. Because, I mean, you have seen, I've done those with those zonules. So. Bruno, uh, Dr. Bruno, you like to add some points? Any quick comment from you? Yes, I agree completely. Wonderful tips soon. And I, I'm definitely going to try your trick with the viscoelastic to not trap the cortex because that's one thing that I always worry. I always try to put the, the CTR in the later on possible. Of course, depending on the case, it's in the beginning of the case, but most of the times it's later on. But I am going to remember you in my next subluxated lens and try the, the viscoelastic tip. That was really good. Congratulations Thank on the you. key. Dr. Ahmed, any, any quick comment from you? Dr. Ahmed, can you hear us? Any quick comment, sir? Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Sir. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 of course, uh, I don't put the CTR uh, routinely in most of the cases. I just put it, the CTR in, uh, in the medium and uh, severe subluxation. But I do believe that just implanting the three-piece IOL in the sulcus in cases of mild subluxation, it helps a lot in the centration of the IOLs in this case. This is my technique in this case. But I totally agree that uh, the technique that uh, Shun has uh, showed us is wonderful. And the, the most issue, the most um, important issue here is not to entrap the cortex while implanting I... the CPR. Yes. So I think uh, the audio, audio audible, one audible. offline, somebody else can take over. Priya, maybe you can take over. Yeah, I think that, I think uh, it was uh, really wonderful seeing. It's always a pleasure to see uh, Dr. Chi's uh, videos. I just love them. So uh, I think uh, that was uh, amazing things, uh, great learning uh, uh, points in that. And the comments that I'm really getting is, you know, people are really amazed by the kind of uh, surgery that Dr. Chi has uh, shown. So, I think uh, uh, it was overall a very good uh, thing. And if anybody has any queries, we can just go ahead with that. Uh, so, Gaurav, uh, from the team IRSI, I just want you to have two words, two liners, please. Yeah, thanks, Sonu. So I think, uh, you know, these uh, webinars that we've been able to arrange, I must congratulate mm -hmm. your team. You know, all of you did such a fantastic job. You know, I, for, for this time, I did not feel that one and a half, two hours go away like that. You know, sometimes it's a pain to sit through these uh, webinars. Today's was fantastic, all amazing surgeries. And this, uh, you know, combined AIUS, IRSI webinar, you know, it's uh, going great with Dr. Maipal and Dr. Namrata's support. I think IRSI is being able to bring in some amazing uh, international faculty as we had today. And each of uh, them showed such fantastic stuff. Our Indian, uh, you know, viewers would, would have definitely benefited a lot. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, doing this joint exercise and for all the international panelists to come in. And on behalf of IRSI, Dr. Amar, Dr. Maipal, Dr. Dhami, I would like to thank all of you to, you know, uh, join us today. Thank you, Sonu. Dr. Gaurav, uh, can we talk about the Top Gun session which we are organizing? Oh, yes. Uh, and in fact, tomorrow, uh, 6.30 p.m. India time, Dr. Rohit has organized one amazing session. That's again an IRSI session. Dr. Rohit, would you like to tell us more about it? Yeah, I think we are organizing a Top Guns International Session wherein uh, we have faculty from all across the world and it is uh, being done with the uh, IRSI uh, and the, the foreign faculty which we have is Boris Meliguin. She is definitely there. Then we have Ronald Yaw. Then we have Marconi Santiago. Then we have, uh, you know, these are the uh, five main speakers from the international one. The national one we have... Uh, Dr. Gaurav to start with, Dr. Rohit Shetty is there, Dr. Shrignesh is there, and then, uh, you know, and we planned it out in such a way that we have, uh, you know, four uh, minutes talk, followed by, you know, the four minutes, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, discussion in, in, in between. So it will start at 6.30 p.m. sharp tomorrow. Great. Uh, Dr. Mahipal and Dr. Namrata, ma'am. So I think it is our pleasant duty to thank everybody to organize this. We would like to thank uh, you, Sonu, most for uh, coordinating this with everybody. 
uh, we would like to thank all the viewers there who have been watching it on the facebook on the youtube as well as on our web series uh, also irsi for uh, doing this with us and the uh, audio visual team uh, who's there at the back end jnj for sponsoring it and our aios headquarter team who coordinates uh, mr kripal and rakhi and uh, thank you for doing this sir i think dr tel raviv is back uh, to say byes and uh, you know sergio wants to say something as well sergio you would like to chip in please guys thank you for this to, for this invitation invitation uh, amazing meeting and every time you need to me i mean i'm here in brazil just invite me and congratulations for our organizers thank you so much thank you thank you my paul sir डिस्टेंसिंग so all the best and the hope uh, all of us uh, stay safe and stay healthy and uh, best wishes thank you so i'd like to thank uh, team aios team irsi and especially professor amar agarwal for making us this show and the thank you all participants for being uh, with us and performing a great and showing up a great show thank you so much thank you very thank much thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you thank you there are a lot of congratulations for uh, all the organizers nobody has talked about it's full of congratulations for you so no is there yes thank and you want to know whether this team. will be available so this will be available on the aios as well as irsi uh, website for everybody to see the, the videos were fantastic today yeah. and we'll mail the links for the recorded so that you can have uh, all of you with you yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.